and welcome to a video lecture on vertebrate development. I'll be talking about what happens during and after fertilization in vertebrate animals. Recently, many secrets about how development is controlled have been discovered and more is being discovered every day. I'm personally fascinated with the development of organisms and, and in awe of nature's ability to reproduce. As you study the early development of organisms, you come to realize all the similarities between all species who reproduce sexually. Get ready to take some notes. Copies of the slides I'll be showing are available at this link. Here's what a human oocyte, or egg, looks like just after ovulation. Remember that for many animals, meiosis in an unfertilized ova is stopped in phase two of meiosis. It's a haploid cell but it won't complete meiosis until after it's fertilized by a single sperm. Review spermatogenesis and oogenesis if you've forgotten these processes. The, the oocyte nucleus is here. The cytoplasm has all the organelles necessary to support the cell's metabolism. The zona pellucida is found in mammalian eggs. It's a glycoprotein membrane surrounding the plasma membrane of an oocyte. The zona pellucida is surrounded by the cumulus oorphus. The cumulus is composed of cells that care for the egg when it's emitted from the ovary. These inner cells of the oorphus are called the corona radiata. So to create a new diploid cell, fertilization has to happen. Obviously, this is when one, one sperm enters the oocyte. This light microscope picture is neat because you can see the many sperm and the zona pellucida. But really, even though only one sperm will ever enter the oocyte, it's a team effort by the thousands of sperm that may actually encounter the egg. Here's why. Let's look at a model of the sperm and oocyte meeting. Entering the oocyte is not as simple as having the sperm swim in. There's some work to be done by the sperm. After wiggling its way past the cells of the corona radiata, it will encounter the zona pellucida. That, that's the glycoprotein membrane surrounding the plasma membrane of an oocyte. The zona pellucida binds to the sperm membrane and signals the release of enzymes in the acrosome of the sperm seen here. These enzymes begin to disintegrate the zona pellucida. Proteins in the sperm head and on the oocyte membrane match up together and then allow the nucleus of the sperm to enter the oocyte. Once this happens, sodium ions flood the membrane of the oocyte, immediately depolarizing it. The depolarization actually prevents any other sperm from entering the egg, a process called blocking polyspermy. Look at that word and figure out what it means to the fertilization process. About 20 seconds later, granules called cortical granules are released just below the oocyte membrane, creating a hardened layer around the now fertilized egg. It takes about a minute to form, but this is the fertilization envelope that permanently prevents polysperm. The release of calcium ions stored in the oocyte prompted to complete meiosis too, forming another polar body. The two pronuclei, one with the father's contribution of chromosomes, known as the paternal chromosomes, and the other is the homologous set of maternal or mother's chromosomes, form this, a diploid zygote. Here you see the new formed zona pellucida, the new diploid nucleus, and the supporting cytoplasm. The first mitotic division happens at different times in different species. For humans, the first mitotic division occurs about 30 hours after fertilization. Then mitosis happens very rapidly. Mind you, for humans and all other mammals, this zygote is still in the fallopian tubes on its way to the uterus. As the cell divides by mitosis, the cell numbers increase, forming first a solid ball of cells called a morula. After about five days, it sheds the entire protective covering of the zona pellucida, 
Then a hollow ball of cells called a blastula begins to turn its efforts to the division of cells inside the hollow blastula. About six days after fertilization, and still before the egg has reached the uterus, the activity of rapid cell division turns to a mass of cells on the inside of the blastula called the inner cell mass, abbreviated the ICM. This layer of cells, called the tropoblast, will secrete enzymes that help the blastocyst implant in the endometrium the lining of the, of the uterus. The blastocele, notice the spelling here, kids. It's funny to hear students pronounce this the first time they try to read it. This is simply a fluid-filled cavity of the blastocyst. The rest of this depiction is specific for placental mammals, or eutheria. The other smallest subclass of, of mammals are metatheria, and those are marsupials. Humans are eutheria, or placental mammals. Later, the cells of the tropoblast continue to divide and secrete the hormone human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. This will aid in the formation of the placenta. The placenta is an organ that allows for the developing embryo and later the fetus to exchange nutrients, gases, and wastes with the mother's circulatory system. The placenta is completely made of cells from the tropoblast and belong to the fetus. I'd like to get into all of these other features you see here, but I'll let you investigate further on your own if you're interested. This is an introduction, so let's move on. At this point, the human chorionic gonadotropin does a number of different things. It maintains the corpus luteum so that it continues to secrete estrogen and progesterone keeping the uterine lining from disintegrating. HCG inhibits the anterior pituitary from releasing follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone so that another follicle does not mature and ovulate while all of this is going on. HCG is secreted in high amounts for two months and then declines significantly around month four. Its levels can be detected in the blood and the urine and are the basis of the early pregnancy tests. After the third month, the first trimester, the placenta takes over the secretion of estrogens and progesterone that help maintain the uterine wall. At the same time, the tropoblast is hard at work creating all of these changes. The inner cell mass is busy dividing too. The second phase of development is called gastrulation a migration of the cells of the inner cell mass inward becoming what is called a gastrula. The inner cell mass is what will actually become the embryo. All of these cells are undifferentiated stem cells, but genes are already starting to change the course of development for some of these cells. In the middle is formed an indentation called the primitive streak that gives the animal bilateral symmetry. Two distinct layers of cells are first formed, the ectoderm and the endoderm. Cells that remain on the top layer of the gastrula begin to divide on, their, on either side of the primitive streak, forming a third layer sandwiched inside called the mesoderm. The mesoderm is formed as additional cells migrate inward between the endoderm and the ectoderm. To jump ahead here, we can see the fate of each of these cell layers and their contribution to the different tissues needed to make the organs and organ systems of the body. The ectoderm provides cells that will develop into the nervous tissue, the brain and the spinal cord, and the epidermis of the skin. The mesoderm will become muscle, red blood cells, and tissues of the circulatory system, and parts of the kidney, connective tissue, bone, cartilage, and parts of the digestive system. The endoderm will help form tissues of the respiratory system, liver and pancreas. That's not a complete list, but a complete list isn't necessary. Well, I could go on, and I will, but that's enough now for part one. You've got a good deal to get familiar with. In part two, I'll discuss Hox genes and how it is that these cells start to differentiate into all the different tissues of the body, as well as how the embryo coordinates the formation of all the body parts. Until then, we'll see you back in class.